Hi there, this is Ron Rogers, and this is August 2024, a tour of the Antique Aircraft Association Air Power Museum. All right, here we are at the Air Power Museum, founded in 1965 at the Antique Aircraft Association annual fly-in here. First time I was to this museum and this is continuing my small out-of-the-way museum tour first time I was to this museum was 53 years ago when I first learned uh, to fly and I didn't come back and of course you can't have a museum without a gift shop there's Lindbergh not really Lindbergh just a bust but this is a really cool museum and it's one of those little out-of-the-ways of course you have to be a member of uh, AAA, not that AAA, Antique Aircraft Association uh, to uh, come to this place. I guess you could probably come to the museum, all right, but to, to land here, I think you have to be a member because um, it's one of those private air, air, airports. But they've got quite an interesting and unique collection. It's these collections that, uh, you know, exist really all over the country there's just a plethora of small museums like these that have all sorts of artifacts there's a balloon basket old papers old instruments goggles models propellers some in better condition than others oops oh you can get models and everything buy models every model i built as a kid uh, i ended up unfortunately destroying that's an interesting propeller and i guess this is where old propellers go to die or become clocks Ooh. and here's kind of a cool simulator look at that Curtis Wright Flight Trainer. Okay. Interesting. The old J8 type of attitude indicator. Not your standard six pack. Of course, that was uh, developed as a standard later on. Beautiful little models. Oh, old radios and instruments. models. Some beautiful models. This is the secret Norden bomb site. I bet it is. E6B compass. Hmm. Seat pack parachute. Probably not serviceable anymore. When I was skydiving, we jumped old World War II parachutes, and lines would break, and I would just sew it together. Panels would rip and I just put some ripstop tape on and I guess we didn't realize now on the shoots They, they give a 15 20 year life. We were jumping these things um, At the time it was only 30 to 40 years after World War II, but still um, The uh, the shoots weren't in that good a condition. They uh, tended to uh, have parts fail But uh, we didn't know any better. The reserves were the same way. We were using old uh, paratrooper reserves front pack and uh, they probably weren't in the best condition either um, nobody talked about service life uh, back then on parachutes uh, I guess they later found out that nylon doesn't last forever hmm aircraft cameras oh this this uh, submarine this uh, airplane that could be launched from a Japanese submarine. I was in the uh, Restoration Museum 
of the uh, National Airspace Museum. And uh, we, we were having an ALPA meeting, Airline Pilots Association. I had the chief test pilot of Airbus and Boeing there. So we were able, or the head of flight test, we were able to get a special private tour of the Restoration Center. And they had one of those uh, Japanese airplanes that could be taken in to the submarine and they were undergoing a restoration. I actually had a couple of old sounding rockets. Uh, I did a video on that when I worked for Dr. James Van Allen, the space physicist. I wasn't a space physicist, but I worked for a space physicist. Okay, a rocket scientist. He was a rocket scientist. Yeah, portable power unit on a B-29. That's interesting. Oh, these old engines. That's amazing. Anyway, uh, I asked him if they would uh, like uh, these. They were called raccoons. I asked him if they'd like it. Uh, they weren't terribly interested, uh, which I thought was interesting. Uh, there's an old flight suit and life preserver, Mae West. They weren't that interested, and then I saw the restoration center and the storage. They have so much stuff that they cannot display. It's just unbelievable. So I still have those raccoons. Uh, they'll probably end up in a museum somewhere like this, maybe a little small museum after I'm gone. Uh, it'll be kind of cool. I've got some paperwork with them. So uh, people will know what they are um, afterwards because you always need to leave some sort of documentation or people will have no idea what these things are or they try to research them. Of course, the internet is a big deal now. I was thinking of buying one of these, a full-size one, not a little one. Um, with the internet, what it is now, you could probably look them up fairly easy because that's where I actually got a lot of the latest information on them, trophies and stuff. Here's where all your trophies wind up after you go. Um, yes, dark little corner of a museum, plaques and stuff like that. And I'll see if I can't get a little tour from Brent on this. Oh, I think that's the aircraft they're restoring. I have to ask him about that. I love these old engines. And it's amazing how, you know, technology progresses and actually such a horrendous rate and of course a lot of these with the cutaway parts were used for training a kinner k5 engine uh, swallow travel air fleet model 2. okay it's interesting how these old uh, engines they uh, they have the cylinders placed quite a bit uh apart they were lower power obviously um hmm. uh, you know, they didn't start really stacking these things up and getting all the power they could out of radials. And of course, they had these huge radials stacked four deep and they had cooling problems and they were made out of magnesium and they had fire problems like on the B-29. And uh, that's when we reached the epitome of that engine developed. And then the jet engine came along. It's kind of like the, um, the museum in London there, the science museum where they showed how advanced uh, steam generation had become. And I mean, it, it's really, they have huge steam engines in there and it's amazing to see the, uh, the technology, how it develops until the point that it is totally replaced by a new form of technology. Now, that's an interesting little high speed boat it looks like. Uh, Atwater Kent, an old radio. Yes, I had a couple old radios like this, actually a little fancier than this, and I ended up destroying those as a kid. Yeah, see here we're getting the, uh, the higher power engines with a much more radial uh, cylinders stacked together. And of course you have to have an odd number of cylinders. Now Ed Freun, whose father was had the title of chief inventor for Goddard, he was the uh, chief uh, shop maintenance guy at the University of Iowa and built all the satellites. He actually built an eight-engine radio just before World War II, and he's going to try to put it in production, but then World War II came, and he ended up welding um, uh, exhaust systems for the B-17s and that, so he never developed it. But it was a little model, um, smaller than that by about half size, but he took me out to his place one time. He had an airstrip on his farm, and he showed me it, and I mean, all the... Uh, all these, uh, the cooling uh, veins there, they weren't cast. He machined those all, and it was just obviously beautiful workmanship. 
and uh, the, he started it up and it just purred. Of course, he's passed away now for quite a few years and I have no idea what happened to that engine. Oh, okay, this. Partial pressure suit. Okay, this was here 51 years ago. I'm going into the Air Force, okay? They use these in like the F-104. Obviously a much smaller person than me, but, uh, and it was probably 53 years ago in a lot better condition, but it's kind of, it's still here. Helmets, neat pictures, oh yes. And the, well this is interesting, a uh, little more m modern aspects of this, and the pulse jets like they use on the, the V1. V stood for very large, very loud. No, it stood for vengeance. Interesting little jet engine there also. And obviously with the cutaway, these were training aids. Um, because we had a lot of things like this when I was uh, in the airline, and you see that they uh, this is a a uh, link trainer, and uh, they actually had one of these in uh, at United Airlines in the uh, the lobby. Uh, fortunately, they don't use them anymore. Um, yeah, nice J8 in there, and you notice the central instrument is the turning bank up there at the top. Um, yeah, interesting layout of instruments. Kind of far apart, it doesn't make your scan easy. And a stick, but this was a link trainer. All right. Oh yes, I have one of these Blue Angels pictures. And uh, my youngest son actually got that for me. Not, it didn't come from the Blue Angels, it came from him because he knew somebody who was involved in getting those uh, produced. Oh, that's the historic restroom. All right. Yeah, he, uh, so I got the, and the Thunderbird, when I had my uh, co-pilot in the Airbus, who was uh, Steve Anderson, lead Thunderbird for two years, he uh, signed a picture for me. So that's kind of cool. Now here, this is the Hall of Memories, and this is kind of cool. Um, now I'll show you something in here. The, um, of course, I have tons of coffee mugs. Ah, Robert Taylor, Flying Farmers. Hats. Oh, I have so many hats. Every time I test flew an airplane, um, they gave me a hat. So I have more hats than I know what to do with. These are a lot. Trophies. Plaques. Ah, and room for more. Oh, Paul Pulverizny. Yeah, I was out to his hangar. You know, they didn't allow alcohol at the time. They didn't allow it on the airfield, and I thought maybe Paul might have been a teetotaler. And then I saw his hangar, because I was thinking of buying his PT-23 at one time. It was still being put back together. But uh, I saw his hangar, and he had a rather magnificent bar, so there was no question that he was not uh, a teetotaler. So, yes. And another display case waiting for fun new things. Ah, now this is, this is what I was looking for, the Coles. I don't know how many people still know about the Cole brothers. They uh, see his Dwayne Cole. It's on the uh, airplane upside down because uh, he flew inverted a lot. But uh, he was uh, from Illinois and he did a lot of um, air show work. Him and his brother, they had uh, uh, air shows that they did only for about 10 years though. His uh, son was killed uh, in a steerman. Um, and I got the book To a Pilot, it's called. Uh, that Dwayne wrote. Also, I used in my aerobatic school, I used Conquest of Lines and Symmetry. Um, and uh, that was written by them. Great book on aerobatics. Um, but uh, both of the Coles have uh, passed away now. And I wonder how many people really uh, remember the name. That's the thing about, you know, a lot of these really great uh, pilots and aviators and their time passes and, uh, you know, they kind of Descend into obscurity, if you will. 
but at least uh, some of them remember in a small museum like this. Uh, yes. Oh, that's a nice, uh, well, of course, he was the founder of Antique Airplane Association in 1953, and I'm going to get Brent, his son, to tell about that. We were out last night, sitting in the, in the dark in our chairs, uh, and I didn't have my camera recording, and a lot of the stuff I would have edited out, it was really kind of uh, interesting to me, and surprising, actually, on uh, some of the things that were said, and I couldn't, you know, not stuff I could really uh, post, unfortunately. Uh, but it was uh, quite interesting, uh, the background and what these people know and uh, who they knew and uh, their experiences over the last 50 plus years. And uh, of course, Dave Dacey is out here. Um, uh, and uh, he ran uh, the Dacey Air Shows for about 50 years and his uh, sister, Susan Dacey, is still flying as chairman. Uh, and they got an amazing uh, history in aviation. So this is, look at that, you can get yourself a picture taken next to a famous aviator. There I am. Yeah, better. Okay. But that is the tour of this small, out of the way, very interesting aviation museum. Hey, thanks for watching. Well, Friday morning, August 30th, we had a really good rain shower last night, but no hail or anything. And here's one of the big events, ice cream and pie. It's uh, one of the highlights, and here's one of the hangars. We've got quite a few hangars here with quite a few aircraft being restored or aircraft that have been restored. Interesting gliders. And this is an aircraft that they're having a campaign to restore. Oh, look at that old radar scope in the corner. Oh, isn't that something? Mm -hmm. huh. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it obviously needs a lot of work. And they're going to make sure they have all the money collected before they start actually the restoration project, which is actually a really good idea. And this is a typical hangar where, boy, do they have this thing in tight. Now, there's a nicely restored aircraft. Interesting <laughs> ah. little airplane from Pella, Iowa. aircraft in the back and above mm -hmm. Ooh. actually a way I can get through here <laughs> now they got quite a few projects under restoration or being restored A lot of history. Yeah, this is one of the early types. You sat in a wicker chair, and they didn't like you to wear seat belts. It was a big fight. You know, you're sitting in this open aircraft in a wicker chair, but the argument was if you had a landing accident and you had a seat belt, it would uh, make it difficult to rapidly get out of the aircraft. So they didn't wear seat belts. And that's how Harriet Quimbley uh, was actually killed. She was one of the first female pilots and she was thrown out of the aircraft when her passenger decided to move and it threw the center of gravity off 
and she was ejected out of the aircraft. Very sad tale. And that's interesting, half of a radial engine. <laughs> Well, thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the Antique Aircraft Association Air Power Museum Tour. Thanks for watching.